Oh, yes, that one gets me every time. I just love seeing John the Baptizer run through wild nature. It's just awesome, so fun. And uh, due to your special request, I think we need a little punch the devil today. Here we go. So uh, you, gotta, you gotta stick with me fast. Like if, if, you're, gonna, if you're gonna catch up with, with what we're doing around here, you gotta pay close attention. It just all of a sudden comes and you might have missed it. If you stayed a little long after and didn't listen to the announcements and you're just getting back to your couch right now to see what's going on, you just missed a punch the devil and uh, it's not coming back again for a while. So uh, you're going to have to watch your reruns, play it back, roll it back. What's the, what is the thing they say? Run it back, run it back, run it back. There you go. Uh, hey, everybody. My name's Evan. If you don't know me, maybe you just stopped by, you're scrolling through, you showed up here. Uh, welcome here. I'm the lead pastor. This is Northgate Church, and uh, we are so glad to get to do this together. Uh, so glad that we continue to get to do church in a very different way, but, we, but God is alive, and he's moving, he's touching lives, isn't he? Amen? Amen. Amen. And uh, we get to be a part of it, and so I'm just so blessed and honored that I get to serve with this team of people. Wasn't the worship team awesome today? Can we thank the worship team? Wherever you are, here we go. Let's thank the worship team. And our tech team, come on. Thank you, tech team, for all that you do. It's just a, it's a treat being part of the church and getting to serve together and uh, be involved in this together. It's just awesome. If you're new here, we also, let's give it up for those who are new here. Come on, welcome here. We want you to know that uh, God loves you, and um, our, our whole entire purpose as a church is to, is to invite you to know the Jesus that we know. There's nothing about us or me or anything that makes me special or us special or anything. We all just look towards a very special God who touches our lives and cares for us and has grace for us, and so you're invited right now to be a part of this. We really believe that God can actually meet you in your living room. We would have stopped meeting a long time ago if church was just about, you know, getting bums in the seat or just getting together or it was some sort of social club. We would have just stopped doing that. This is way too much work if that's the whole point of church. But the point of church is about Jesus Christ and him still moving and his Holy Spirit is not bound to a building. And so we believe that wherever you're at today, you can have a real, authentic encounter with Jesus Christ. You and your kids, whoever's sitting with you, uh, we, we just really believe for that. And so we're going we're gonna to open up our hearts even right now. I don't always do this, but I just want to pray for you even before we start this sermon uh, right now. We've had lots of prayer. We've had some worship. But come on, can you just open up your hearts right now and say, say that, God, I want you to move. So, Lord, we just open up our hearts. We open up our hearts to you, Lord. We want you to move. We actually do. We actually do want you to move right now. This may be the first time that someone's praying that. Maybe if they were in church, they'd be nervous to pray now. They'd be feeling weird, but in the comfort of their own home, when no one's watching, I pray that they would, just, they would just take up an audience with you, that they would just allow themselves to know that you are with them and real, and that you want to touch their hearts. Open us up each to have a real, authentic, true, meaningful encounter with your Holy Spirit today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we've been walking through a series called The Baptizer, uh, which is why we have a bumper video with The Baptizer running through the woods, and it's awesome. And we've been looking at this guy named John, The Baptizer. And this is an important character in Scripture because no one of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who all tell the story of Jesus, like the Old Testament tells pre-Jesus, Acts of the Apostles, and the rest of the New Testament tells post-Jesus, the four books of the Bible that talk about during Jesus, when Jesus is there, all of them have John the Baptizer right at the beginning. And so we got to look at John the Baptizer and figure out, what is this guy all about? Why? he's so important. We found out two weeks ago that he had this calling of God, 
that he just knew that there was this calling placed on his life, and it was before he was ever even born, God had placed this plan and purpose in his life, and he was meant to turn people's hearts towards, uh, towards God, that he was going to turn people around, that he was going to live this specific life. And then last week, we talked about how that would have looked in his kid years and teenager years, and sort of trying to process, what does it look like for me to live a calling amongst people who maybe aren't living that same calling? What does it look like for me to separate myself from the world that I want to impact? What does it look like for me to look a little bit different and be a little bit different? My church friends don't think I'm normal. My not church friends don't think I'm normal. And now I'm starting to wonder a bit about myself. Am I normal? And yet I feel like God is calling me to a different kind of life. That's what we saw with John the baptizer last week, and then this week we're going to look at, so what was the message that he was actually saying? Here he is in the wild. He's got his camel hair outfit, leather belt on, he's eating locusts and honey, and he's living in the wild, and eventually we're going to see that people are going to be coming out to him. Next week we're going to talk about his influence, but this week we say, what is the message that was so compelling, that was drawing people out into the wilderness to come and hear what John the baptizer had to say. This guy who, who, who seems so different than the rest of the world, because right now, let's be honest, if you knew there was someone running around in the woods uh, in a camel hair, leather strap, uh, eating locusts and honey, we, you probably, unless they had a really good message, you probably wouldn't go sit at their feet and listen to them. You might go like, you, you, you maybe would try to find them, like Sasquatch or something like that. You'd maybe like to write, write stories about them or mock them or laugh at them, but probably you're not going to go and be one of their followers, one of their people who listens to them unless there's something really compelling that they're saying. What is the message that they're saying? I had a friend this week. Uh, I was chatting with, with him, and he's been walking through a hard time. He's a Christian friend, and, and uh, he just said to me, Ev, I just, I, I've been asking God, what do, you, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to, uh, 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 what, what do you want me to be at this stage in my life? And he just said, he felt like God said to him, prepare the way. So John the Baptist, whole mission, prepare the way. Let's look at the scripture we've been looking at a few times. Uh, Mark 1, 1 to 3, it says, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah, the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. So what is the message that needs to be spoken that prepares people for, for Jesus? If Jesus is about to show up, what's the message that people need to hear? If he's about to walk on the scene, if God's ready to move in people's life, what is it that the messengers of God need to be saying? What is it that those who are called by God to make an impact for God, what is it that they need to be saying to the world around them? And this is what, what, what we're seeing uh, in this moment. So Mark's very first scripture, I, I want to take a second and just do a little bit of a biblical dive into this one, because Mark's very very first uh, piece that he says in there, he says, as it is written in Isaiah, the prophet. But then the first thing he says isn't written in Isaiah, the prophet. He, he says, as, as Isaiah said, uh, and then he quotes someone else right away. And some people have said, maybe he misquoted that, or he didn't mean to do that, or maybe he tried something else, and he didn't get there. Well, I don't know what happened. But one of my favorite profs, when I was uh, just starting uh, in some Bible school stuff, he, he blew my mind when he talked about this story. He called it a composite citation. He said, this is, this is Mark's way of pointing everyone to the actual message of John, of helping everyone hear what was actually going on. Because if everyone just was sitting in a circle like, oh, a messenger speaking in the wilderness, how cute and lovely, let's eat honey. Mm. That'd be nice. But he goes, as it is spoken in Isaiah, and then he turns your attention quickly to somewhere else in Scripture. Where he turns your attention to is, is this, this Scripture. It says, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way. It goes back to Exodus 23. It goes to two spots. We're going to look at both of them really quick. Exodus 23, 20 to 21. What has just happened is that Israel's been, in, uh, been enslaved for 400 years. They just got set free from slavery. They got moved out into the wilderness. When they moved out into the wilderness, they know they're going to the promised land. And as they're on their way to the promised land, 
God gives them all these rules on Mount Sinai. He gives them how to build the tabernacle and how to worship me and how to follow me. And here's the, here's the festivals that you need to celebrate. Here's how to do your sacrifices. Here's how to treat these people. and how treat these. Here's how we're gonna do all of these rules and things like this. And then Exodus 23, 20 to 21 says, see, I am sending an angel ahead of you. Come on, a messenger ahead of you to guard you along the way and to bring you to the place I have prepared very similar language. Pay attention to him. Listen to what he says. Do not rebel against him. He will not forgive your rebellion since my name is in him. And so John, talking to all of these people who had come out to see him, he says, listen, I got to tell you something. This is really important. And God, I'm not the first messenger that God has sent. God has sent messengers before. He sent one right after he gave you the law and was about to send you into the promised land. He gave you a messenger and said, follow that messenger. Listen to that messenger. Hear what that messenger has to, has to say. And how did that go? Is I think what John would have probably been saying. How'd it go? Did you follow the rules pretty well? Did you like do everything that God asked you to do? If, if you've ever read the Bible, you know that's a big old pfft. You did not follow the rules. You did not do what God asked you to do. You did not accomplish the, the things. God gave you a very clear plan and it, it did not happen. You failed in that one. What was God's response? Well, I ha you're gonna have to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. Finally, I'll give you the promised land. You're gonna continue to rebel against me. You're gonna continue to push against me. You're gonna continue to turn to other gods. You're gonna continue to treat people unkindly. You're gonna continue to be greedy with your money rather than generous with your money. You're gonna continue in these ways to to the point where eventually I am going to kick you out of the promised land. And so the next big moment in Israel's history is the exile from the promised land. It's in that spot that Isaiah is speaking when, he, when, that when Mark quotes him, says, but he's coming back. He's going to bring you back. He's going to restore you. Then they do come back. They make their way back to the promised land. They, sh they, they show up and God said, I'll bring my glory there. Just follow what I ask you to do. Just live the way I've called you to live. Be a blessing to all nations. Treat each other this way. Follow these plans. And, and when you come back, I will, my glory will fill the temple again. You will be my people. I will be your God. And you will be a blessing to all nations. Fortunately, they come back. They fail miserably again. They drop the ball like crazy. They don't follow any of the rules that, that uh, God has asked them to follow. And so prophets start speaking against Israel. Malachi 3, 1 to 2 is another. First, let me just remind you of what Mark says. Mark said, in the, uh, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you. Here's Malachi 3, 1 to 2. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. See, Mark wasn't confused. It wasn't like he was like, oh, no, no, don't, don't. Uh, here's what, ha what is said in Isaiah, and like, oh, did I get it wrong? No, he said, here's what's said in Isaiah, and those people would have known what was said in Isaiah. They would have recited it when they gathered together. They would have spoken it. This, that part of Isaiah was regularly returned to over and over in their scriptures, and he, they know he got it wrong, so what is he doing? He's bringing them to a different moment in scripture where this isn't just about a messenger are coming and saying, hey, good news. We got a great message. It's awesome. This is a messenger coming and saying, remember the time the exodus happened and that my deliverance happened and I pulled you out of slavery and I said, I've got a promised land and a great plan for you. If you just follow my ways, remember that you didn't. And remember that you didn't so much that I actually had to move you out of the promised land, but even when I moved you out of the promised land and you, you, you were gone from there and you called on my name, I said I'd bring you back and I brought you back and I just asked you to follow my decrees. Remember what that? And remember when you didn't again? Remember when I loved you and you rejected me? Remember when I gave you a, a plan for your life and you rejected it? Remember when I showed you the way you should walk and you walked in the other direction? Do you remember that? Remember when I sent a messenger and you said, no, I don't care about your messenger? Here's what it says in Malachi, which Mark quotes, says, suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. 
the messenger of the covenant, whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. By the way, that's just a sweet picture, isn't it? He's gonna be like soap. <laughs> like you, you're asking for God to come. If he, when he shows up in the temple, he's gonna remind you uh, that, that you've been walking away from him for all of these years. He's gonna remind you of the plan that he had for your life that you still wanna reject. See, you want God, but you don't want his, his lordship in your life. You don't want his leadership in your life. You don't want his direction in your life. You just want him to come and bless you and save you and deliver you and do all of those things. And he did. Before you were ever good enough, he did that. But then when he showed you what relationship with him was going to look like you rejected it over and over and over. And this leads to the last part of Malachi, which is the last part of the Old Testament, which is the last thing we hear in the Bible before the book of Matthew. It's Malachi 4, 5. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. Now, I want you to picture the scene. Right now, in our culture, someone's running out in the woods in camel hair, leather belt, honey dripping down their chest from lunch, locusts in their hair for a snack for later, and they're saying, you have all rejected God over and over and over and over and over, and his fire is coming. The judgment is coming. It's about to show up. I wonder who's going to go out and listen to this person. I don't even know if anyone would have then, except the anointing of God seems to be on him. The call of God was there, and so people were drawn to this person, were drawn to this one, and so then they would ask the question, well, if that's the case, if that's true, if judgment is coming, what do we do? And John would be like, well, ding, 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 God sent a messenger first. Because you deserve his judgment and his wrath. But God is throwing you a piece of grace and saying, will you choose me first? And then we get into the message that John spoke over and over and over and over. This is the one message he had. He didn't change it. It became the same message he spoke every single time. By the way, I feel just a little bit ripped off that John only had to preach one message. I, I mean, that, that, that's, that's, I have people regularly say to me, Pastor, I just need a little bit more. You just give me a little bit more meat. I'm like, well, go get the meat in your Bible study. <laughs> Oh, can you just give me a little, I just love a little bit more depth. Can you just take me a little deeper? And I'm like, well, uh, I'm thinking about the person who's brand new here who, who doesn't need the, the deeper. They just need the nice shallow swim and need to understand some things before we get way down there. So let's just hold up a second. I've had people leave the church, actually, because the sermons were just a little bit too simple. John only had to preach one message. Ever. Uh, this calls for a joke, actually. Maybe you've heard me say this story before. There's this one story where this pastor shows up to a church. Brand new pastor to a brand new church, never been there before. He starts the job and preaches the first, first week and just an absolute zinger. Uh, and, and everyone's like, oh, cut to the heart, pastor, amen. They were, they were cheering them down, and maybe it was COVID, maybe they're in their living rooms, I don't know, but anyways, they're like, yeah, what a message, awesome, we're so glad you're here, pastor, that's exactly the type of preaching we need, come on, and then they all go home, and he's like, oh, okay, that was, that was awesome. Next week, they all show up to church pumped, like, where's he going to take us now? And he gets up, and, and he starts using the same story he used last week, and they're like, why is he using the same story? And then he transitions to the same Bible story he used last week, and they're like, why is he doing that? And he's got the same points that he used last week, and soon they realize this is the same sermon as last week. 
Oh, hold up a second. Why is he doing that? And so they're like, wait, wait, no, no, this isn't what we're looking for. Uh, but maybe he just had an off day, something's going on, comes back next week, same sermon, next week, same sermon, next week, same sermon. Eventually, the muttering gets too much, and they're like, okay. Someone pulls the pastor, says, pastor, listen. Uh, I don't know if maybe we can get you some help if you need help because maybe, maybe things aren't working fully uh, functioning in your mind, but you've preached the same message for the last six weeks. And the pastor goes, oh, I didn't know anyone was hearing because no one was applying it to their life. Oh, <laughs> so that was John's message. He had one message. Because if everyone would apply this one message to their life, he knew the world would be changed. If everyone would apply this one message to their life, he knew that everything would be different, that all righteousness would be discovered, that all generosity would be taken care of, that the poor would be fed and looked after and clothed, that those who had received injustice in their life would find justice, that those who had walked in loneliness would find friends. If only this one thing would be applied to every life, it's the only message message and only sermon I'll ever have to preach and it's a one word sermon John's one word sermon to every single crowd he had was repent repent that's it repent yeah there's a wrath coming of God. You've been, a, you've been choosing every other path in your life. Didn't mean to rhyme wrath and path. I'm not going to play with that any longer. You've been avoiding every, everything that God has for your life. You've been pushing it aside and wanting to choose your own way. And his wrath is coming, but by grace, God has said, I'm going to send a messenger ahead and let those people know that, yes, I'm coming with wrath, but if they would rather the fire, the, the, a different kind of fire to touch down on them rather than the fire of judgment, that maybe they'd have a fire of the Spirit burning in them. Maybe, just maybe, they will actually turn to me. Let's give them one more chance. Let's throw it their way. And then John shows up and says, here's the option. You can either have, feel the full wrath of God because you've been avoiding him and pushing away from him and and living every other way than his way for your life all of these years. Or you can repent and people are flooding out of the city to come and hear this message, to come and take part in this message and saying, how do we do it? What do we do? And he's baptizing people who are saying, I've repented. Baptism is the sign that you have given up your life and you are living now in Christ, that your own plans die and you receive God's plan for your life. Your will dies and you you receive God's will for your life. Everything that you thought you deserved dies and you start thinking that God deserves a whole lot more than you. The glory that you are living for in yourself dies and you live for the glory of God now in your life. And, and John is saying, the wrath of God is coming but repentance is yours and if you want it and you want to give up your life, you can live for Jesus and he's got a good plan for you. People are flooding out to hear about it. And we see a little bit more about repentance because in Matthew 3, verse 7 to 12, it says John saw a different crew coming out. It said, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, which in that time meant welcome. Nice to see you. Just kidding. Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Like, well, you did. You're uh, the messenger. Like, what, what are you talking about? No. Who, who warned you? And so John's kind of like, wait, I thought the fire of God was coming, and I was kind of wanting to watch you burn. Terrible Pharisees who have made everyone feel like they're complete jokes and terribly unrighteous and completely unworthy for your entire life. I was hoping that you were going to burn. Get back to the city and go burn. Who told you to flee from the coming wrath? By the way, John's going to have to deal with that. That's two weeks from now. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? And then he says this. I love this piece. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Usually in scripture, we think of producing fruit as a good, a good deed, something good that you do in your life. And we think of repentance being connected to bad things. 
Usually when we think of repentance, we think of bad people coming to a good God. And, and that, that's sort of their thing. Yeah, you gotta repent. Mm, I can't believe it. Wow, you have to repent again. Oh, wowzers, you're really a slave to that sin, aren't you? I'm gonna go talk to my friends about that. And it says, here's a terrible slave to the sin over here. <clears throat> Anyways, we usually think that that's the bad person and, and the good person is the one who's producing fruit. John puts them together here. He says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. In other words, the bad people are not the, the ones who do the bad things. The, the, the bad people repent and start doing the good things. The good things flow out of people who are bad, and in fact, there is a, here's a good, new, good news for you. Anything that has pleased God, anything good that has been done for God, that has glorified God, has been done by bad people, saved by a good Savior. Nothing can please God outside of faith. The Bible teaches us that anyone who has done something pleasing to God has not done it on their own strength but on his. How do we get his? John's one-liner, repent. He says, and do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. <laughs> You're welcome, Rob. What, what he's saying by that is, is that there's this idea, and it was a biblical concept until God corrected some things. There's this idea that if you were from the right family, you were the inheritors of, the, of God's blessing in your life. And so these Pharisees would walk around and say, <clears throat> excuse me, my blood is connected to Abraham's blood, and so that means that I am good and you're terrible, get out of my way. And they'd walk around and telling people all this stuff, and, jo and John says, listen, don't, you know, don't go ahead and telling people that. He says, I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children of Abraham. Today I went to the beach, and this is a rock. I love what John says about this rock. He says this rock has, as much, has more potential to be spiritual than those Pharisees in that moment. <laughs> He says, God could raise up a child of Abraham out of this rock. But he hasn't raised one up from you. You have tried to live in this entitled position that's made everyone else feel terrible. And so because of that, you've, you are doing nothing that pleases the Lord, even if you think you're so righteous. There's a lot of people who read a lot of Bible. There's a lot of people who, who maybe even pray a, lot, pray a lot of prayers. There's a lot of people who maybe fast a bunch or do a lot of communion that are not pleasing the Lord with their life because instead of that sh shifting who they are, instead of repentance drawing them closer to a place of compassion and generosity and acceptance and love and, and care for people, Instead, they're going, I've repented now. I better become holy. Repentance doesn't lead us to a new ability for, for holiness or, or a new, like, now I just have to try to work my holiness up. Repentance just opens us up for the Holy One to come and indwell us. Repentance only allows us to let holiness come and be a part of our life. Repentance doesn't cause us to become now good enough to be holy or better than anyone else. Repentance only allows us to accept that because of our not good enough and not better than anyone else, we can empty ourselves of our own ambitions and welcome the ambitions of God to move us into a new life. He says... I tell you, these stones God can raise up for children of Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit, every, in other words, the ones that do not produce fruit in keeping with repentance, do not produce fruit that comes from the Holy Spirit, those who do not produce fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I can imagine these people saying, well, well, well what, uh, what do I do then? What does the fruit look like in my life? How will I repent? How, how will I do this? And the first step, John said, and also Peter said later on, if you've repented and you haven't been baptized, that's your first step. 
What should I do? What's the fruit gonna look like? Make it public. Let people know. Get baptized. If, you, if right now you say, I've repented of my sin, I've connected myself with Jesus, I'm following him, and I wanna go after life with him, I, I'm going to heaven because he's taken me there, not because my good deeds are taking me there. If that's you in your life right now, the first thing John the baptizer would say to you, as well as the first thing Peter would have said to you, is now it's time to get baptized. That's the first little piece. But then everyone else is also saying, okay, but, but, but what do I do? How do I do this? And, and G, uh, John actually starts going through that to the crowd. He says, okay, if you have two shirts, this is in Luke 3, if you have two shirts, uh, two helpings of food, you give one helping of food to someone else and one shirt to someone else. That's what you do. You don't keep more than you need and you give, give away to people. You care for people. You look after those around you. A tax collector says, well, what about me? What should I do? I, I, I've been bad my whole life and I've been taking people's money and I've been skimping a little bit from my side. I've got a big house and all this stuff. What should I do? What will repentance look like in my life? And he says, don't collect more money than you need. Well, the soldiers say, well, hold up. What about me? I've been using my power. I've got authority from, from Rome. I've been, I've been pushing people down. I've been treating people terribly. I've been, I've been, I've been uh, using my power to, uh, to extort. I, I, I haven't been who I should be. And he says, well, just don't extort money or accuse falsely. Stop abusing your power. If you have power, use it for the right things. If you have money, share it. If you've got possession, let it figure out how that can be shared amongst other people. This is what repentance is going to look like in your life. Worship team, you can come on up. Then we jump back into Matthew 3, 11. And when they're all saying, well, what do we do? How, 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 do we, how do we handle this moment? What does repentance look like? What does is, what is the fruit of repentance look like in my life? John says this. This will lead us into next week, which is gonna be awesome. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. I can't even touch his stinky shoes. Jesus' shoes never stunk. I take that back. He says, I baptize with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. <laughs> Do you know what I... I God gave me this cool picture. Later on in scripture, we're gonna see this idea of, of when the Holy Spirit moves into our lives, we produce fruit. It's called spiritual fruit. And, and who gets the credit for spiritual fruit coming from our lives? It's God. Jesus Christ gets the credit for that. Well, how do we gain spiritual fruit in our lives? Because we just want to do good things. And, and often it's like, well, I just want to start to be good and, 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 and do all of this nice stuff. And I, 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 want to, I want to read the Bible. I want people to recognize me as a really solid Christian. I want God to recognize me as a really solid Christian. But John says, come to me and you can repent of your old way of life. You can be emptied of your ambitions, of your greed, of your shame, of your anxieties empty yourself of your own ideas of how life should look empty yourself of your uh, frustrations and 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 unforgiveness towards people. Empty yourself of your entitlement. Empty yourself of all the things that keep you from choosing the life I, that God has for you. You can come to me and empty yourself of all those. Repent and be baptized. And when you rise up from the water, the, the, the one who I am preparing the way for is gonna come. And when he comes into your life, it's not just about repentance anymore. Now it's about him coming and baptizing you with the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, you get new gifts, you get new power, you get new revelation, you're going to speak in new ways, you're going to experience new hope and new joy, you're going to see things with a whole new clarity, you will love people before they love you, you'll be generous beyond what you ever thought you could be, you'll be compassionate to those you couldn't have cared less about before, you'll be unified with the body of Christ even though you used to criticize every act of your pastor, when the Holy Spirit comes and fills you everything will look different in your life that will be the fruit that God wants in your life how do I get that fruit empty yourself yeah but when do I fill myself up you don't 
Every good deed that comes from your life should be one that the Holy Spirit started and finishes. Those are the only ones that please God. The Bible says it is impossible to please God without faith. Faith causes us to believe in the one who we repent to. When we repent, faith causes us to stay empty until the Holy Spirit comes and fills us and faith causes us to live out the acts that the Holy Spirit prompts us to live out and watch how God does what we could have never done. So John prepares the way for the greatest work. What is the fruit of repentance? It's a move of the Spirit. Amen. Now, if we want to see a move of the Spirit in this church, it doesn't happen because we're all just really spiritual. It happens because we emptied ourselves, we became vessels able to allow the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to come and just take over our lives. It happens because our repentance led us to baptism, which meant I died to my old life and I welcomed the new one that Jesus had for me. It, me it means that all of a sudden, I stopped fighting for everything that I thought I should get out of this life and I started living for everything that God wanted out of this life. That God could squeeze me out and use me however he wants to use me because in repentance I died to my old ways and I was born again to a new life. One that honors and glorifies only one. And so that's why John's message doesn't change. Someone who doesn't believe in, in, in this Jesus and all of a sudden starts to believe. Someone who's lived a life of sin and brokenness. What is, what is his message? Repent. Someone who's walked with Jesus for a long time. What is his message? Repent. Someone who has read the whole Bible every year for the last 23 years. What does he say? Repent. Right? Well, no, no, I'm kind of past that. It's time for me to go a little bit deeper. The only depth that you should have in your faith is that which the Holy Spirit does through you. You, and it's because you learned that even your spiritual maturity and your biblical understanding didn't make you too good to empty yourself before the Savior of your soul. If you can't repent today, you've lost something along the way. And in the story of John the baptizer, the only ones who had a hard time repenting were called Pharisees because they were just a bit beyond that. Well, I'm not like the rest of these guys. I've been in church for a long time. I'm not like that. <laughs> Today, I have one message for each of you. <clears throat> it's one word. Change your life. Even if you did that this morning, change your life tonight message is repent I have kids I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that I'm closer to my kids right after they repent of a bad thing than when they never did the bad thing in the first place yet we try to hide away from God and pretend that we're good he knows he knows the truth. So if today you sort of recognize what John was speaking about, that, there, that you have walked away from God your whole life, you've chosen a path of your own, you've chosen to live for whatever it is that you wanted to live for in yourself, you recognize that the right thing for God to do would be to judge you, would be to, would be to come and, and, and bring, allow his wrath to fall on you or, or to, to allow you to be left to the wrath of your own decision and just pull away. If you recognize that would be the right thing, but also recognize that God is extending you right now a grace that says, I, I'm giving you another go. I want you with me. I don't want you to miss out on the life I have for you. I don't want you to live in 
the wrath of what it feels like to be separated from me. I'm extending my hand to you. Would you extend it back? Would you come to me? Would you allow me to fill your life? I want to be so close to you that I'm moving actually through your body. I'm actually doing actions for you and helping you. If you want that, come to me and empty yourself out. Repent of all the things you've chosen to live for other than me. And then accept and welcome my infilling because I will fill you up and send you out. If that's you today, say, I need that. I want that. Oh, I want that. Ha, I'm with you today. Would you just raise your hands like this in this moment? I know it's hard in your living room. I know it's challenging, but there's something about when we physically respond to the message. Jesus, thank you for that act of grace. We've walked away a million times. We've chosen our own path a million times. We've chosen greed over generosity. We've chosen entitlement. We've chosen judgment over relationship. We've chosen gossip over encouragement. We've chosen shame over, over love. And today you're saying, you don't have to have what you deserve. <laughs> I'll give you something better. Lord, show us how to just pour ourselves out, empty ourselves of the things we've lived for, of the things we've chosen instead of you so that we might become empty vessels. Lord, thank you for the person who's sitting right in their living room right now saying, no, I'm not good enough for this. No, yes, yes, you are just as good as any other person. You are meant to do this right now. God wants to empty every little bit of you out, every shameful thing that you have done, every broken heart that you have left behind, everything that you've done that you feel like makes you too dirty right now. God wants to wash you clean. He's inviting you to just let that all spill out, pour it out, let him know it. Confess your sin to him. Confess your brokenness to him. Confess the areas that you feel like you're not worthy right now because he's going to fill you up. He's going to give you a new identity. And when you let that part of you die, he's going to show you what real life is like. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God, that we never get beyond this. Every good thing that's going to come from this life is going to come because your Holy Spirit did it. And my job is to, is to let myself be emptied so that I might know the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus, now as people have been emptied, I just pray for that in living rooms right now. Pray that your spirit would just come and move in hearts, filling up these empty vessels. Pray for revelation, words of encouragement. Pray for words of knowledge to show up, new gifts to, to enter into hearts. Pray for fruit, patience, kindness, self-control where there hasn't been before, not because they try for it, but because your spirit does that work in an empty vessel. Touch them, Lord. Thank you for the gift of repentance that we have the opportunity to come back into relationship with you, be empowered once again to live the life you've called us to live. We love you, Jesus. Lead us this week. In your name we pray. Amen.